So now that we understand in principle how we're going to measure the running time of algorithms, it's time to start doing it in practice. We need some techniques. We start with a very easy one. Suppose your algorithm has a block of instructions here, and then it has another one and they're completely independent of each other. Everything here is executed and then everything here is executed. There's no relation between them. Then it's pretty easy to see that the running time of this block plus the running time of this block is the running time of the two blocks. In other words, running time adds for disjoint blocks. Now, of course, most programs have more interesting control flow here. For example, they have things like loops. Let's imagine we have something like this. For i from 1 to n, just some pseudocode, no particular language. j from 1 to n squared. And then we do some constant amount of work every time we go through. What's the running time of this code fragment going to be? Well, how many times does the constant amount of work get done? How many pairs i and j are there in these loops? Well, i goes from 1 through to n. j goes from 1 through to n squared. For every value of i, we run through all values of j before going to the next value of i. So the answer is clearly n squared times n. And the total amount of work is going to look something like constant times n cubed. The key point here is that the loop variables i and j do not interact. i does its thing, j does its thing. We could in fact reverse the order of those loops, run through every possible value of j, and for each j run through all i, and the same thing would happen. So this is a simplest case where you have nested loops. The loops are nested, but they're essentially independent. So the big picture here is that for independent nested loops, the running times multiply. They don't multiply exactly, but up to a constant. For example, if I just ran through here for i from 1 to n and do this constant amount c, I'd get c times n. If I ran through the j loop, I'd get c times n squared. If I multiplied those two together, I'd get c squared times n cubed. But here we're only doing, we're only doing analysis up to a constant. And we're looking at the order of growth, the n cubed part. So now I want to have a look at a few specific, very simple algorithms, which we're going to use later on as building blocks, for example, for sorting algorithms. And we can get some practice analyzing these. This is an algorithm that takes an array with n elements and two indices, i and j, pointing into the array and swaps the elements at those positions. It creates a single temporary variable, t, saves the old value of a of i, overwrites that with a of j, and finally a of j gets the old value of a of i. Each of the lines defining the function translate to a fixed number of elementary operations. And so this is called a constant time algorithm because the running time is independent of n, the input size. So here's another algorithm. It's a standard building block of other algorithms we'll be using later in the course. And the idea of it is to find the maximum of an array of n elements. These elements can be any type of data as long as they are comparable. In other words, they come from a totally ordered set. We can always tell whether one is bigger than another. And what does it do? It starts off saying that the best I've found so far is the first element of the array. Then I scan through the array one at a time till I get to the end. At each stage, I update the maximum appropriately if I find something better than what I already had. 
Notice if this, the maximum occurs in several places in the array, there's not a unique maximum, it will just find the first one. But what's the running time of this algorithm? We should be able to see now, I hope that there's a constant amount of work at the beginning, initializing k, and then you basically have a loop, j running from 1 to n minus 1, and then a constant amount of work in there. It may be slightly less work. If the if statement fails, then you don't have to do the assignment. Uh, if the if statement evaluates to true, then you do have to do the assignment. So that is definitely a linear time algorithm. And basically, it's passing through the data once and doing an amount of work which varies a little, but it doesn't vary by much. And in any case, it's at least some non-zero amount, and it's at most some other non-zero amount, and those amounts don't depend on n. We're going to make this reasoning a little bit more precise soon, because it's a little annoying to keep talking about n minus 1 as opposed to n, and this constant and that constant. What we're really interested in here is how it the running time scales as n gets big, and we can see here that it's roughly doubling as we double the input size. That's the kind of thinking we want. Now let's have a look at another example, and this one, we are doing something trickier with the loop variable. Instead of going through just one at a time, we're going to be doubling each time. So i starts at 1, as long as i is less than n, we double it, and we do some amount of work. We print the value of i, and we just go around. Now, the key thing here is that, again, we've got a constant amount of work inside the loop, and what we are interested in just is how many times do we go around the loop. Now, the number of times around the loop is... relatively simple to calculate. i first gets the value of 1. Next time round it doubles, gets 2, 4, 8, and then it keeps going until it's approximately equal to n. n if n is not an exact power of 2, it won't hit n exactly. It'll be just below n and then it will jump to bigger than n. That's not going to make a big difference. What we're interested in here is, let's call this k, the number of iterations. So what is that number? How many times does it go around? Well, this is 2 to the 0, this is 2 to the 1, 2 to the 2, etc. And if we have k iterations, the last one is going to be 2 to the k minus 1, because we started counting from 0. Okay, So, it's a number such that 2 to the k minus 1 is less than or equal to n, but if I went one further, 2 to the k is definitely too big. Okay, it's the largest number k that satisfies, it's the only number k, in fact, that satisfies that property. n is squashed between two powers of two, consecutive powers of two. Yeah. So it's that number, that's a definition of what k is. Now, if we take the logarithm to the base two on each side, remember that's how logarithm to the base two works, it's precisely the number of times you need to double something until you get to the original number. Anyway, k is now, it's the unique number integer which satisfies that property. We can express this in terms of the floor and ceiling function. Right? This number here is an integer which is the biggest integer less than or equal to this thing here. So 
So k minus 1 is the biggest integer which is less than or equal to log n. You go one more and it's too big. Okay, the biggest integer less than or equal to something is called the floor. of that integer, and so k is 1 plus the floor of log n. For example, if n is equal to 7, here, it would be in here, I'd go around 1, 2, 3 times and not the fourth one. The log of n is less than 3. It's 2 to the 3 here, so it's 2, right? Uh, 2 point something. When I take the floor, I get 2. Add 1, I get 3, which is the number of times we go around. It's not really important that it's the floor and the 1. What's important is that k is about log n. Okay, it's close to large, it's close to log n. We'll make this more precise soon. Now if we look back here, k is the number of iterations, and we know we're doing a constant amount of work. So the total amount of work is something like constant times k, number of iterations, it's like about constant times log n, plus some other smaller terms. One is smaller, log n is getting big, very slowly, but it's getting large as n gets large and the 1 will turn out to be somewhat irrelevant. Again, we have to formalize that soon. Now, we're going to have a look at one more. We're going to look at some nested loops, but whereas before, our first example, the nested loops had no interaction between the loop variables, this time we will have interaction. So you have a loop over i and j. i goes from 1 to n, but j goes from i to n. The amount of times j is going around that loop depends on the value of i. And then once you get inside the inner loop, you're doing a constant amount of work, just printing some sum of two integers. So the key thing we need to do again is look at how many times do we go around these loops. Well, i is going from 1 up to n, and j is going from i up to n. Okay. So here i is 1, 2 to n. j, the first time, is going from 1 to n. Then it's going from 2 to n. Okay, n to n. That's not a very useful picture. A better picture would look like this. 1, 2, n. Now, this is the first row. j goes all the way down there. The second row, j goes down here from 2 to n. And by the time you get to the last row, where i is equal to n, j is just going from n to n. So it's just that one. So the total amount of work being done is the sum of all these, which is n from the first one plus n minus 1 plus n minus 2, plus dot, 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 plus 1. That's how many iterations we're going through with our, both our variables. Okay, for each fixed i, you go through a whole lot of j iterations, but it's a different number depending on the value of i. This sum here is easy, just the sum of an arithmetic series. Well, you know the sum of the first n integers. It's n times n plus 1 over 2. Now, the important thing here is that it looks like n squared times a constant plus some smaller thing, much smaller thing. For large values of n, the n squared is going to dominate the n. Again, we're going to make this much more precise in the next lecture. But roughly speaking, this is a quadratic time algorithm because we were doing a constant amount of work in the inner loop and we just need to count how many times we go through 
this, this pair of loops, and the number is that, which is roughly it's what we'll call of order n squared. So that was an example of nested loops where there was a relation between the control variables. It's a relatively simple one because uh, even if we hadn't had one at all, we'd gone from 1 to n, then the answer would have been n squared, the total number of times you went through that loop. However, in this case, we get about half of that, but more than half of that. Okay, but it doesn't change the basic order, the fact that it's n squared as opposed to, say, n. So now, as always, we come to the questions. And the first one deals with this issue of approximately counting. In the end, how much do we care about the difference between n squared and 2 times n squared? Or n squared and n squared plus n? Or log to the base 3 against log to the base 2? How much difference does it really make when we're trying to make clear distinctions about the efficiency of our algorithms? That's the first question. I just want you to think about that, and we'll deal with that actually in the next lecture. Next question though, what happens if we make these examples that I was going through today more complicated? What happens if there's actually some interesting control flow? So far all we did was a few loops and a constant amount of work in between. There we had a little bit of interaction between the loop variables. We could have much more complicated interaction between the variables. But more to the point, we never even dealt with if statements. Normally, you'd have a loop, and you'd have, if this happens, then do that, otherwise do that. Well, how does that affect the running time? So that's a key question. Last question, what is the running time of slow fib? More generally, remember that it was a recursive algorithm. It was the way of calculating Fibonacci numbers that mimicked the recursive definition of the numbers themselves. So far, we haven't discussed any way of calculating the running time of a recursive algorithm. Perhaps not surprisingly, the answer is going to involve recurrence relations. In other words, the running time itself is going to satisfy a recursive definition, and we're going to have to solve that. So that will be a later lecture. But for now, see whether you can work out which recursive relation is satisfied by the running time of the algorithm slow fib. Well, that's all for now. See you next time when we're going to talk about asymptotic notation, which is the way to formalize these ideas of we only care what happens for large values of n, we don't care about lower order terms, and we don't even necessarily care about constant factors.